Children of the Night, Spawns of Satan, Bloodsuckers, Vampir Nosferatu. We're talking about vampires, folks. Specifically, the top 15 vampire films of the 1970s. Grab your steak, hammer, and definitely don't forget a crucifix. And let's go hunting. How's it going, my friends? Welcome again to the Cobweb channel. My name is Daniel, and as today we're continuing with this ranking series on vampire movies that we kicked off recently with the Top 15 Dracula Movies video. Now with the Top 15 Vampire Films of the 70s, I almost didn't put my number 15 on this list. But you know what? It's interesting, it's unique, definitely has a cultural impact, and I wanna talk about it. So for my number 15, we're putting Blackula from 1972. So in Blackula, we kick off in the 18th century where an African prince is visiting Count Dracula in Transylvania. After they have a bit of an argument, Dracula curses him by turning him into a vampire for all time. Seems like a reasonable reaction, right? But picking up modern day in the 1970s, this African prince, Prince Mamuwalde, is resurrected from the dead and is now on the hunt for the reincarnation of his lost wife. So often when people hear the title Blackula, they're expecting some kind of a spoof. I mean, the title is a pun. It's black exploitation Dracula, duh. But actually, the movie takes the premise very seriously and is a legit horror film. You might even say it's a legit horror romance. So by far the best thing in this movie is William Marshall as Prince Mamu Walde or Blackula. That's not his name. That's just a silly title. No, he is a strange dude. He's great in this movie, such a commanding presence, a deep, booming voice. He's also one of the most sympathetic vampires. Now, the tradition of a vampire being a tragic figure who doesn't want to be a vampire, but is cursed with this and really is just a romantic who wants to reunite with his lost love, typically a reincarnation of his lost love. That's kind of a cliche now. We've seen that a million times. Not as common in 1972. We did get to see some of that in Dark Shadows for sure. Sure. But Dracula movies were not typically like that in this time period. But here we've got a very sympathetic vampire who has a pretty legit romance with this woman who's the reincarnation of his wife. We really do care about them and they're a nice couple in this movie, despite the fact that he's a blood-sucking vampire. Now I did hint when I started talking about this movie that I do have problems with it, and I do. I think the biggest problem is just the direction. This film's directed by William Crane, who basically just did television before he did this movie, as far as I know. And the movie just feels flat. Other than William Marshall, so much of this movie is just lacking energy atmosphere, striking visuals. It really just doesn't have much of those things. And when I watch this movie, I really just want it to pop more than it actually does. Also, I'm not a big fan of the soundtrack. It's got funk music throughout, which I understand. It's a 70s black exploitation film. When it's a pretty classical vampire movie like this is, I really just kind of want a traditional horror score. I think the Hammer film Dracula AD 1972 struggles with the same thing and Blackula definitely does as well. But nevertheless, I'm happy to have it on the Scream Factory double pack Blu-ray. William Marshall is awesome. It definitely has a cultural impact. So it hits the list at number 15. At number 14, my favorite Spanish horror filmmaker is hitting the list and that is Paul Nashi with Count Dracula's Great Love from 1973. Four women and one man have their coach break down and end up spending the night in the old deserted sanitarium of a mountain where they meet a very mysterious scientist played by Paul Maschi and wouldn't you know it, he turns out to be Count Dracula. Now this movie starts out as a pretty typical Dracula Prince of Darkness knockoff, the Hammer film from the 1960s. The most typical gothic horror premise you've ever seen where people unexpectedly have to spend the night in a spooky mansion and they turn out to get a lot more spookiness than they bargained for. Weird thing about this movie as a Dracula movie is for a while you, I guess, technically aren't supposed to know that Paul Nashi is Dracula. He gives a different name. He pretends to be just some random guy. He really just seems like some random guy. And it's not until like the final third, maybe second half, that we find out that he's Dracula. And this movie takes a very strange idea in that whenever we see him as Dracula, we don't actually watch him talk. We just telepathically hear his thoughts booming. It's a very strange effect. And it's one of the reasons the final third of this movie is anything but a Hammer Dracula knockoff. It gets really trippy and weird in a way I totally was not expecting. And the movie also has certain plot points that it just kind of abandons and ends up going much 
much more a romantic route. I mean, Count Dracula's Great Love, the title kind of tells you. It's an odd movie, but definitely one I really like. Incredible vampire visuals, atmosphere, and you will probably never see any other movie with more vampire biting than Count Dracula's Great Love. More vampire bites per minute than any other movie. I'm, I'm standing by that right now. At number 13 is the first appearance, but definitely not the last of my beloved Hammer films. This is Lust for a Vampire from 1971. So this movie picks up with our leading man who is a horror fiction writer who writes about spookiness, but doesn't actually believe in things that go bump in the night in real life. You and I, we know better, right? He travels to a village that is all very scared of vampires and visits an all girls school where he meets a beautiful, blonde woman named Mirakala instantly falls deeply in love with her and he makes the questionable choice to trick their English teacher into <laughs> leaving the country so that he can take over as the English teacher and woo this young woman. Now the first time I saw this movie I was like well that is a super creepy thing to do. I don't like this guy. I don't like our protagonist but upon a rewatch for this video I realized well this woman Mirakala spoilers she's a vampire and vampires are are usually understood to have supernatural attractive powers to people around them. I mean, Dracula traditionally does. So this guy's kind of under the supernatural spell of a vampire. He's making questionable choices. I'll excuse it in this, ju ju just this once, but fellas. Don't do that. Lust for a Vampire is billed as an adaption of the classic vampire novella, Carmilla, which did come out before Bram Stoker's Dracula. But other than the character of Carmilla, this really has nothing to do with the original story. And you gotta give this film credit for 1971. It is a romance movie where a man falls in love with a vampire. And that was not common at this period of time. And I do actually end up liking our leading man and their romance, I actually kind of get into it, which I'm surprised surprised about, but of course it is a doomed relationship because she is a blood-sucking vampire, part of the Karnstein family. They're all very creepy. There is so much incredible vampire atmosphere and visuals in this film, particularly Carmilla's resurrection is such an iconic image. And I do want to give our lead actress credit who plays Carmilla, Jute Steingard, or perhaps Jute Steingard. I swear I looked this up and now I'm forgetting. At this point, Hammer was kind of famous for casting models who had done some kind of nude photography work, putting them in their movies, even when they weren't very good actresses, and often dubbing over their voices. Now, Hammer does dub her over in this movie, but it's actually a really good dub. You can't quite tell. And I do think she gives quite a good performance. I think she actually turns out to be very good Carmilla, even though Hammer did have a better version of Carmilla, which we'll talk about a little bit later on this list. At number 12, we've got Daughters of Darkness from 1971. This film follows a newlywed couple who are passing through a vacation resort. There they meet a mysterious and strikingly beautiful countess named Countess Batori, who claims to be the descendant of the infamous Countess Batori, who drank and bathed in the blood of women to achieve eternal youth. So much because of a Hammer film that came out in 1970 that, again, we'll talk about later on this list, lesbian vampires were very popular in the 1970s, particularly with European films. And Daughters of Darkness does fit into that, although there's a lot of sexuality going on with this movie, but it definitely is a lesbian vampire film. The movie is beautifully well-made, first of all. Visually gorgeous, fantastic performances. You really have to shout out Delphine Seyrig as Countess Batori. Her performance, I think, is incredible. A strikingly beautiful woman who is shockingly charismatic, magnetic to the screen. You really just can't keep your eyes off of her, not really just for her looks, but just how dynamic her performance is. And you completely understand the characters around her being drawn in by her magnetic power, which is ultimately ultimately what a vampire should do. So judging by that, she's like one of the great vampires, I think. One of my favorite female vampires in screen history, for sure. And because there is a lot of sexploitation with vampires in the 1970s that was very prevalent, a lot of vampire films are trying to be sexy. I do think there's a lot of them that don't really achieve that, but Daughters of Darkness does. There's definitely a very palpable eroticism to this movie that is very effective. Yeah, it's hot. 
It is hot. We're, we're finally getting hot. I sadly don't have a physical copy of Daughters of Darkness, but it is on 4K from Blue Underground. Just outside the top 10, we've got the werewolf versus the vampire woman, also from 1971. Two young women are traveling through the French countryside, searching for the lost tomb of a medieval murderess and possible vampire, Countess Wandessa. They find a likely site in the castle of Waldemar Deninsky, who invites the women to stay as long as they like. But as they find the tomb of the Countess, they accidentally cause the vampire to come back to life hungrier for blood than ever. And now this man, Daninsky, needs to unleash his own supernatural horror secret to fight the lady vampire. Yes, this is another Paul Nashi movie, but this will be the last time that we talk about him on this list. The Werewolf vs. the Vampire Woman does have to be a little bit lower on this list, despite the fact that I really love it and actually recently saw it for the first time on this Vinegar Syndrome 4K Blu-ray. Absolutely love this thing. Because I do think this movie is a better werewolf movie than it is a vampire film. I do like the vampire woman. She has a very atmospheric presence and she also turns another woman into a vampire. I love her look. Just got teeth hanging out of her mouth. It's such a classic pulpy 70s look to a vampire with a lot of slow motion to make them even creepier. But it is the werewolf stuff with Paul Nashi as Waldenar Daninsky, this werewolf character that he played over many, many movies that I do think is the standout of the movie. But still, it's a 70s vampire movie and I really really love it. I like the romance between Paul Nashi and our leading lady. Really big fan of that woman as an actress. I don't know her from anything else, but she's fantastic in this. And Paul Nashi, he's just He's an awesome werewolf, just one of the best. Tracking into the top 10, Hammer Films is back with Vampire Circus from 1972. Vampire Circus basically kicks off with a typical climax to a vampire film played very quickly. It's like the Mad Max Fury Road of vampire films for about 10 minutes. The citizens of a small countryside village get really riled up about the Count who lives in the big castle over there who is a vampire and is stealing their wives and daughters. And they go up with their torches and pitchforks destroy the place, kill the vampire, rescue some people and leave others for dead, and the vampire vows one day he will come back. Picking up years later, now all those guys are the old men of the town and a disease has struck their village. Just about this time, a circus comes into town to perform for the villagers, but is it possible they're bringing some vampires on with them? Like, you know, it's like a a vampire circus. Oh, that's why they call it that. I love Vampire Circus, but it's absolutely insane. <laughs> it doesn't always make a ton of sense. This movie takes more liberties with the vampire legend and their powers and such than like almost any other vampire film I've ever seen. I mean, they even like shapeshift into panthers and stuff. Now, I believe this movie had about a six week shoot. They went over schedule into seven weeks. They got cut off at that point. And the editor was basically just given the footage that they did to assemble some kind of a movie. I do think it kind of shows with the weird story structure. It doesn't totally feel like it has a single protagonist. You kind of get these two teenagers who emerge as the protagonists in the second half of the movie. And I do think they're very likable. And I like just, this is a classic classic Hammer movie from the perspective of basically kids. But yes, it's weird. It's all over the place. I'll just go ahead and tell you the main vampire who vows he will return to destroy the village one day. He gets resurrected in like the last two minutes of the movie. So I have to assume there was supposed to be more, but this is what we got of him. I respect this movie because it's clearly trying really hard to be different and unique at a time when this genre was pretty overcrowded. I actually don't own this one on Blu-ray. It's very available on streaming, but you can't can get it on Blu-ray from Synapse. At number nine is the TV adaption of the classic Stephen King novel, Salem's Lot from 1979. Author Ben Mears has returned to his hometown to write a book about the supposedly haunted mansion in the town. When people around this house start dying mysteriously, Mears discovers that the owner of the mansion is actually a vampire who is turning them into an army of undead slaves. I don't often include TV stuff on my list, but this is only a two-part miniseries Series. And when you watch it on Blu-ray, it really just plays like a three-hour movie. So it, it, in my head, it's definitely a movie. And it's fantastic. Now, I will admit, the main criticism I hear of this movie a lot is that it's too slow, it's drawn out, it's kind of boring. And I, I will say, I actually agreed with that the first time that I saw it. That was my first impression. But I re-watched it recently, and I actually really loved it, and I didn't find it boring at all. Even though this could clearly easily be tightened up, there are certain side plots in here that 
don't need to be here at all, but I really don't mind because I just enjoy the atmosphere of Salem's lot of this town. I enjoy the main character of Ben Mears, his romance with Bonnie Bedelia, random townspeople around. It's a very typical Stephen King kind of a town, and that's just a vibe I love to live in. But you've got to shout out the lead vampire, Kurt Barlow, played by Reggie Nalder. This thing is visually incredible. They clearly went for a Nosferatu-like design, but went even further by making him completely blue, having these glowing eyes. It's one of my favorite vampire designs of all time. I think it is so cool. Now, he's not in the movie a whole lot, but when he shows up, my God, it hits. You will not forget a single shot of it. But the crazy thing is, it's even debatable if that's the best vampire stuff in the movie, because the scenes of a vampire child floating up to the window of another child might actually be the most genuinely frightening vampire imagery that has ever existed on film. So shout out director Toby Hooper, director of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, for making this honestly pretty landmark TV miniseries. I love Salem's Lot. Uh, it might be long, it might be a little slow, but it's a world I love to live in with some of the best vampire content you're ever going to see. But continuing the trend of talking about movies with a Nosferatu-influenced vampire design, Valerie and her Week of Wonders from 1960. So this is based on a 1935 novel of the same name, and the film is part of the Czechoslovakian New Wave. In addition to being a vampire movie, this is very clearly a fantasy, almost fairy tale like coming-of-age movie about a young girl named Valerie. She's a Czechoslovakian teenager living with her grandmother in a small village, but her coming-of-age is only uh, quickened, you might say, by the effects of putting on a pair of magic earrings. Now she sees the world around her in a different light, and she must attend attempt to discern fantasy from reality as she encounters a lecherous priest, a vampire stranger, and otherworldly carnival folk. Yes, like Vampire Circus, this also involves a carnival circus coming into town, bringing vampires with them. And the main vampire in this movie is frightening. I love his look so much. Again, he also has a very Nosferatu influence-like look, but unlike Kurt Barlow, he actually speaks. He's an intelligent vampire. There are very interesting conversations in this movie. Movie. And the place where he lives, his home, is an incredibly creepy atmosphere. Love it so much. Vampires are traditionally gothic horror, but they can fit into folk horror as well. And I think that's where this movie lives. It's a very fairy tale like folk horror film with a frightening vampire, a likable protagonist, and very strange and almost avant garde like filmmaking, which is not always my thing, but I really loved in this case. At number seven is a movie I know a lot of you are waiting for and now is the time, Count Yorga Vampire from 1970. So this is the story of two couples who become involved in a seance led by the intense Count Yorga in Los Angeles. After driving the Count home, one of the couples, Paul and Erica, get stuck in the mud and have to spend the night in their car, and the next day, Erica is diagnosed by their doctor as having lost a lot of blood. She's then later found feasting on the family cat, and the doctor becomes convinced that vampirism is at work, probably probably perpetrated by Count Yorga. Interesting thing about the behind the scenes of this movie is it actually started out as an adult film, a skin flick version of a vampire movie, but ended up getting turned into just a straight up horror film, possibly due to Robert Quarry coming on board as Count Yorga and him possibly pushing them in that direction. Although the story isn't totally clear, but it's interesting that that's how the movie started out because it's not a very explicit movie. It's actually pretty chaste for the most part. Uh, the most sensual moments are this particular vampire bite between Count Yorga and the woman Erica, which kind of takes the more sexual way Christopher Lee bites women a step further. But overall, it's just weird that that's how this movie started, because you really wouldn't be able to tell. But Robert Quarry plays Count Yorga, and he is awesome in this movie. He's clearly a Dracula stand-in, and so much of about him is like exactly one-to-one -one Dracula. And this movie could have easily been a Dracula movie, but I'm glad it wasn't, because instead of Robert Corey just getting compared to every other Dracula, he is his own horror icon. He is Count Yorga, and I love that. And he actually is very distinct from Christopher Lee Dracula, who is much more feral, a monster in almost all cases. Robert Quarry is the smartest man in the room. Robert Quarry is always a step ahead. He always makes a point to point out that vampires are the most intelligent beings because they've been around the longest. A much more eloquent, old world nobility kind of a vampire. But when it's time for his vampires to really come out, 
out, he doesn't hold back. He can be that hissing, snarling beast. He can have the greatest evil laugh you've ever heard in your life. I just love Robert Corey in this role. He's so, so good. There are moments when this movie is a little bit slow. And the first time I saw it, actually, it was a little bit slow for me. But I don't know. Maybe my tastes are changing. I rewatched this movie a couple of nights ago to make this list. And I just loved it from start to finish. Also, the cat eating scene, very transgressive for its time. Awesome seance scene. There's so much goodness in this. Count your guys, it's pretty awesome. Just outside the top five, my number six is House of Dark Shadows from 1970. Directed by Dan Curtis, creator of the original Dark Shadows series, this very much follows the template of the at least opening arc of the Dark Shadows series, kind of played in fast motion. You've got Jonathan Frid as the iconic Barnabas Collins, an old vampire who is revived from the dead and goes back to his family home of of Collinwood and meets his descendants posing as a distant relative. There he finds the reincarnation of his lost love Josette and possibly finds a cure to his vampire affliction. Much like we talked about with Blackula, I actually think Dark Shadows, to my knowledge at least, feel free to correct me in the comments, is the prototype for the reluctant, sympathetic vampire who really just wants to find love above anything else. I love Jonathan Frid as Barnabas Collins. Now, I was a casual watcher of the TV show as a kid, pop in sometimes, but it's more so this movie that's really just made me love him. I just love him as Barnabas Collins. He has such an incredible look. His weird hair and the coat and the cane, the wolf cane is so cool. I really, really want one. For my money, he's one of the most iconic looking vampires. I just love it. And the performance is so good. The movie's not always quite as good when he's not on screen, but whenever he's there, I am locked in. In. House of Dark Shadows does feel a bit clunky because it's a TV show arc that's packed into like a 90 minute movie. It does feel rushed. It does feel clunky at times, but I'm just a big fan of it. It's got some great visuals, great vampire atmosphere, and Jonathan Frid is awesome. Cracking into the top five is Blood for Dracula from 1974. Count Dracula is in Transylvania, deathly ill because he's gone so long without drinking virgin blood because wouldn't you know it, there's no more virgins around. His slimy underling convinces him to travel to Italy because there's a lot of religious people there, probably then a lot of virgins, and he's welcomed into the home of a once aristocratic family who is now desperate to marry off their daughters to wealthy suitors and there he gets to bite his way through these women and finds they're not quite as pure as he thought. This was also released under the title Andy Warhol's Dracula, but it's written and directed by Paul Morrissey right after he made Flesh for Frankenstein, also with Udo Kier. And I've yet to find a good answer for why it was called Andy Warhol's Dracula. If you know, let me know in the comments below. I would love to find out. But anyway, this is a bizarre telling of Dracula. It stars Udo Kier as a pathetic and slimy version of Dracula that Dracula sometimes is very alluring, but here he's just like gross. I've talked about this movie on my channel a lot recently, but one thing I haven't talked about is Joe Delisadro, who plays Mario, who's like the manservant of this aristocratic family, and kind of ends up becoming the hero of the story, the one to figure out Dracula is a vampire, wouldn't you know it? And the interesting thing about him is he is despicable. He's like almost as bad as Dracula, except I don't think he's quite a murderer, but he's just this super sleazy big guy who's having an affair with multiple of the daughters. And once he turns against Dracula, he just goes full on like action hero violent mode. And the finale of this movie is so insane and bloody, this showdown between Dracula and this, this guy, Mario. It, it's just a bizarre movie with really no good characters. It's just bad guys versus bad guys. And I find it sick and disturbing in a way that I find pretty fascinating. But at number four is another telling of Dracula, and that is Nosferatu to the Vampire from 1979. Jonathan Harker is a real estate agent who goes to Transylvania to visit the mysterious Count Dracula and formalize the purchase of a property in Wismar. Once Jonathan is caught under his evil spell, Dracula travels to Wismar where he meets the beautiful Lucy, Jonathan's wife, while a plague spreads through the town. Of course, a remake of the classic silent film Nosferatu. That was actually an unauthorized adaption of Dracula, so they changed the names to like Count Orlock and, and things. And uh, this one, while being a remake of that, does use the classic name. So this is Dracula, Jonathan Harker, and such. But Klaus Kinski 
as Dracula does have that classic Max Shrek look, that Nosferatu look of being bald and the ears and the rat-like fangs. Klaus Kinski is incredible in this movie, much like Udo Kier, but even more so. This is a sick and disgusting version of Dracula. He just comes across as pitiful, just this deteriorating ancient creature who has been living out in away from all civilization in the old world for centuries, and now finally wants to reconnect with the outside world. You just feel like every second Jonathan Arker has to spend with him is deeply uncomfortable, and then he wants to get away from this gross creature as fast as possible. I actually like this movie better than the 1920s version. I think it's more visually beautiful. I think the story is a bit deeper, particularly the ending, and especially the way it treats the character of Lucy and how she is able to contribute to Dracula's demise is far more meaningful and fascinating. And the final twist ending is something I've never seen in a Dracula adaption before. All right, I've hinted at this one a few times and now we're gonna talk about it. My number three is The Vampire Lovers from 1970. So this movie opens up with a vampire family called the Karnsteins being killed off by a baron whose family was victimized by these vampires. But one he doesn't successfully kill off is Carmilla Karnstein. And when this movie is played by Ingrid Pitt, years later, a countess is visiting a general and his family, and when the countess is called away to tend to a sick friend, she leaves her daughter, Mirkala, also played by Ingrid Pitt, uh, with the family to be a companion for the general's daughter, but then the villagers start dying. The general's daughter becomes very weak and pale. Could it be that Mirkala is actually Carmilla the vampire? Yes, it is, absolutely. This is also based on that classic vampire novella, Carmilla, and supposedly, although I haven't read that, it is the most faithful adaption of that story. In 1970, Hammer was looking to capitalize on the fact that the British film censors were relaxing quite a bit. They were proposed with the idea of adapting Carmilla, and that really became their avenue to make a more explicit movie, partially in terms of the violence, but much more in terms of the sexploitation aspects. This is the lesbian vampire movie. There were a lot, especially in this period, but this is the prototype and probably still the most well-known. Ingrid Pitt as Carmilla is incredible. While on one hand, she was too old for the role. She was 32 when she did this movie. Carmilla is supposed to be a teenager. So there are parts that feel a little bit confusing because it's like, well, this woman is clearly in her 30s, but she's awesome in this. Incredibly charismatic, magnetic, of course, beautiful, looks amazing with the vampire faints. Ingrid Pitt is known as one of the classic Hammer actors with Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, and it's almost entirely off the strength of this one movie. So that really just shows you how iconic she made herself with this film. Hammer made so many beautiful movies, but this is one of the most visually gorgeous, the Victorian period, the fog and the sets. It's just incredible looking movie movie from start to finish. And shout out Peter Cushing as the general. He's great in this movie, even though this isn't one of his most interesting roles. But the hero that I actually end up liking more is Douglas Wilmer as the Baron who first kills off the Karnsteins. He kind of comes across as a more badass hero than even Peter Cushing is. And I love him in this movie. I have the Vampire Lovers on the original Scream Factory Blu-ray, but they have since released a collector's edition. At number two is the final Dracula adaption we're gonna talk about on this list. And this is John Badham's Dracula. Dracula from 1979. Unlike many other adaptions of Dracula, this film kicks off with Dracula arriving in England. It is all about Dracula integrating himself into English society, particularly with the characters of Jonathan Harker, Mina, and Lucy. So Dracula in this film is played by Frank Langella, and he's one of the least monstrous versions of Dracula. If you hear Frank Langella talk about this movie and his take on it, he very much sees Dracula as an erotic, handsome, kind of, you get the sense he thinks like the ultimate male kind of a character, which I think if you read the original Bram Stoker novel is a weird, unusual take, but it does make for the fact that Frank Langella is a unique Dracula. He never shows fangs in this movie, but this is very much a gothic romance film between him and Lucy. You almost like him more than you like any other character, and you start to feel yourself pulled to root for him and Lucy, even though he's definitely a vampire and definitely kills people in this movie. Jonathan Harker 
Parker, I don't find very likable in this movie. And you get Laurence Olivier as Van Helsing, who also, I think, doesn't make a big impression and isn't terribly charismatic or interesting near as much as Frank Langella as Dracula does. And when you get to the end of this movie, I think it becomes clear that that's what they're going for. And this is very much a gothic romance starring Dracula. I actually think Frank Langella is great as the character, and he does still have some creepy scenes, whether it be him arriving at somebody's window or crawling up a wall. And there are similarities you will notice between this and the Coppola version of Dracula from 1992. So I kind of feel like this is the prototype. But at number one is the 70s vampire movie I rewatched the most that I love so, so much. And that is Twins of Evil from 1971. The devil has sent me. Twins of Evil. So this is the third film in Hammer's Karnstein trilogy, but it really has nothing to do with the story of Carmilla, like the first two do. And this really feels like a prequel to those stories, telling the origins of how Count Karnstein became a vampire. While dabbling in the occult and Satanism, Count Karnstein resurrects Miracala Karnstein, who initiates him into vampirism. As a rash of deaths afflict the village, Gustav, the head of a Puritan group, leads his men to seek out and destroy witchcraft. He has two twin nieces who come to visit him and one becomes enamored with the vampire. I have often referred to Twins of Evil as a kitchen sink horror movie and that it throws so much stuff at the screen. This movie has got witch hunting. It feels very much like a witch finder general influenced movie with Peter Cushing as an unusually dark, cold, and kind of brutal character, but it's also got Count Karnstein trying to become a Satanist. He's played by Damian Thomas, fantastically, by the way, so intense and just a great on-screen vampire, even before he's a vampire, just a great kind of evil count. Um, and he essentially gets into Satanism because he's bored. He has this great line where he says, drinking blood is the most extreme of Satan's delight. So he basically wants Satan to turn him into a vampire so he can do something more interesting <laughs> with his life. But you got to talk about the, the twins of evil, right? Played by the Collinson twins who were Playboy models at this time. And their voices are dubbed over, but I do really like them in this movie. They're dramatically different. One of them very much wants to have fun and wants to rebel against her evil, pious uncle Gustav. And the other one is very sweet and innocent and doesn't want to step out of line. Great, great vampire content, Satanist rituals, witch burning. Just for like a full core gothic horror fan, it's really just got everything you could possibly want. I love love Twins of Evil, Vampires versus Evil Witch Burners, and it's an awesome movie. Just by far my favorite of the Karnstein trilogy, the most fun, entertaining, one of the best Hammer films ever made, I think, and one of my favorite vampire films of all time. So that's my list, folks, but let me know down in the comments below what are your favorite 70s vampire movies, and if you enjoy this, check out this playlist right over here of other best of lists that I've done, especially around a lot of horror topics. Give a like if you enjoyed this and a subscribe for more videos like this because my favorite 80s vampire movies is coming soon. And don't forget to take some time to enjoy yourself today and have some fun and I'll see you next time.